It's been a fast year. It's went by pretty quick. Um, but I'm uh, thankful for this week being Christmas and, and getting to spend some time with my family and being off work and all that good stuff. I'm, I'm thankful for that. But this morning, if you would, open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter number 1. Matthew chapter number 1. Last week, we looked at one aspect of Christ's birth. We looked at it from the, the book of Luke. And uh, this morning, we're going to look at some things from the book of Matthew. And, uh, and I love uh, studying the birth of Jesus. Uh, I, I love thinking about what, what was it like that night? What was it like for certain people that were involved in that that night? And uh, this morning, we're going to look at just a few different things and give you some things to think about and ponder on. And, and uh, hopefully, maybe you'll see something you've never seen before. But last week, we went over in the book of Luke. Of course, we know... Uh, historically, we believe that Luke probably got a lot of his information from Mary herself, whereas Matthew, they believe Matthew got a lot of his information from Joseph and everything. So kind of two different uh, perspectives. And, and, and I love uh, Matthew chapter number 1, verse number 18, starting there, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of what? Of the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for the Holy Ghost this morning, for that Holy Spirit this morning. And he says in verse number 19, And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. You know, I'm thankful that Joseph was a just man. I'm glad that, that God knew exactly uh, the man and the woman he wanted taking care of his baby boy. And we see that it says he was a just man. He wasn't willing to make her a public example because during this time, biblical times, the penalty according to the law was to be stoned to death. Uh, if you would be uh, uh, conceived and, 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 and bearing a child before, uh, before marriage and things like that, before Mary and Joseph were married here, and she was pregnant and of course going around and saying, I didn't do anything, and you know, I'm a virgin. And people be like, yeah, right. Uh, the penalty for that is a stoning. And she would have died. He didn't want to make her a public example. He said he was minded to put her away privately. In other words, to divorce her. Because even though they weren't legally married yet, the Jewish custom, the Jewish law, if they were engaged, that was the same as husband and wife. Yeah. It was that kind of commitment to one another. He said he wanted to do that. But I love verse number 20. It says, but. I love those little moments in the Bible when something happens and it changes things. It says, but while he thought on these things, behold, we've talked about that word a lot before, how that, whole, how that word is meant to get our attention, to pay attention. It says, behold, it says, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Could you imagine getting that message, being Joseph, being told, hey, listen, she didn't cheat on you. Don't worry about what's going on. I know this doesn't seem right, but what's going on in her body, that was of the Holy Ghost. And it tells us that he was a just man. In other words, telling us that he was a believer in God. He was faithful. He, 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 this wasn't just anybody randomly picked out there and not a believer. He was a believer, and I'm thankful for that. But he was a just man. He says that thy wife which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son that shall call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. I love that one verse right there. Jesus came. Why? So he could save us from our sins. Yes. He came, why? He came to die. He came to die. Think about that for a minute. A, a beautiful little baby boy born here. He was born to die. And throughout the entire life of Christ, even right here when he's an infant, when he's a baby, we see people trying to kill him. So the shadow of, of, of death, the, the, the death shadow his entire life. But he wasn't going to die until a certain appointed time. When he says, it's, I'm, it, I'm ready to go. The Bible tells us he put his, his face as a flint to Jerusalem. He knew that I'm on my way. I'm going there. And then when he bowed his head on the cross, he said, it is finished. That's it. 
Mm. It was done. It, the, the Father's will was obtained mm. at that point. He, everything was done. He says that he shall save his people from their sins. Mm. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful to be saved. Amen. I'm thankful for salvation. Mm. You know what Jesus means translated? The, word, the name Jesus actually means Savior. A Savior was born that morning, that night. Yes. It says in verse number 22, Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, a talking about prophecy, mm -hmm. which was spoken of, by, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God is with us. Yes. He's with us wherever we go. You know, God, uh, if you're saved this morning, your relationship with Jesus Christ isn't, or it shouldn't be, I should put it this way, isn't when you walk through the church doors, you pick him up, take him with you, and then when you get ready to leave, you sit him back in the pew and go back out. No, you take him wherever you go. Yes. He's with us. We're with him in the relationship. And I'm thankful for that name there, Emmanuel, meaning God with us. You don't have to flip here, but over in Isaiah chapter number 41, verse number 10, I love this. It says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. He's good, isn't he? Yes. He's good. Notice that he says, fear thou not. He does not want the, us to fear. He doesn't want us to be afraid. He doesn't want us to be confused. He says, I am with thee. That was a promise given in the Old Testament, a promise given in the New Testament, and it's a promise we can cling to today. He is with us. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, guess what? He lives on the inside of you. You take him wherever you go. Yes, he knows what's going on in your life. And, and, and he is with you. Through the good, through the bad, through the ugly, through whatever you want to fill in the blank with, guess what? He's with you. Yes, and I'm glad that he's there with me. How many times in your life have you been in a situation where you can literally just feel him yes. there with you? I don't know about you, but I've felt that before. Yeah. You can feel that he's there right beside of you, squeezing on you, hugging on you, giving you peace that passeth all understanding. You can't explain it, but you might be in the darkest day of your life, but all of a sudden you get a peace about something. You have a good feeling about something, and he will comfort you. Guess what? He's with you. He's with you. I'm thankful from Genesis to Revelation. Guess what? He's with us. He's with us. And if you're saved this morning, guess what? He'll be with you for all eternity. Yes. I like that. We do our prophecy study on Sunday nights. We talked about the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign. And then we last week, we just got talking a little bit about the new heaven and the new earth. Listen, I'm talking about forever, eternity. We have those promises. He's with us now. He'll be with us then. Yes. I'm thankful that he's with us. He says in verse number 24, then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. Aren't you thankful for that, that uh, he had the obedience to do what was told to him? Mm -hmm. Notice that he got up from his uh, sleep, he raised up out of that dream, and, what he, and it didn't say that he tarried around any longer. It didn't say that he tried to bargain, uh, uh, bargain with God here on this. It didn't say that he was contemplating different things. It simply just tells us he raised up from sleep did as the angel of the Lord uh, uh, bid him. Mm -hmm. How much better would our lives be if we just simply do what God says to do? Yes. Yes. Instead of arguing about it, instead of trying to uh, bargain about it, instead of trying to do this, doing that, if we just do what God says to do, wouldn't our life be a little bit easier? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of times we kick and scream, don't we? Mm -hmm. But it says in verse 25, and Joseph here, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Chapter number two has always been a fascinating chapter for me as far as the um, uh, birth of Jesus goes because of the wise men. And we see in verse number uh, one, chapter number two, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. 
Now, first of all, Herod the king, I don't know if you know this or not, I was doing a study. I love genealogy in the Bible because it's so important to see who came from who. Herod the Great here, Herod the king, he was actually a descendant of Esau. Remember Esau back in the Old Testament? Saw his birthright, didn't he? Listen, don't ever think what you do won't affect the generations down the road. Because Esau sold his birthright. He sold out. And now look what happens here a, few, a couple thousand years later. We see Herod the Great. He's a descendant from Esau. It says that he was the king. It says, Behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem. Now one thing to take note of, many people say, you know, we three kings, three wise men, right? Honestly, we don't know that. Nowhere in Scripture does the Bible say that there were three wise men that went to see Jesus. I just want to give you a little bit of trivial stuff there. The reason they say that there's three is because they bought, brought three gifts. Y'all will break the sense of murder. So they think that each one of them probably had one. That's where the three wise men come from in regards to the birth of Jesus. But truthfully, scripturally, we don't know how many wise men. Okay? Now, wise men during this time, they were looked at and sought after and stuff as astronomers, as scientists, as, as political power. Uh, many of them actually knew Old Testament prophecy and things like that. So no doubt when they saw this star, they knew, hey, this is what the Old mm -hmm. Testament prophets were talking about. Mm -hmm. They knew. It says uh, in verse number 2, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now a few things about that. Verse number 2 starts out by uh, saying the word there, saying, and then comment. I was reading after one uh, uh, commentary about that in writer, and he said, if you notice, it says, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem. In verse number one, it says, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? It means they actually were going all over town, all over the city, asking people, have you seen this star? Have you looked up and seen that star? Where is he at? Where is he at? Where is he born? They were diligently looking for Jesus. They knew that he was born. Why? Because of that sign that was given because of Old Testament prophecy. Remember, the Old Testament always points to the coming of the Lord and stuff the first time. And, and the, the, uh, the New Testament always points right back to the cross. And I'm thankful for that. But these wise men, they were going around all over the town, all over the city saying, where is he? Where is he at? We see his star. He's born. They were diligently searching for him. Why? It tells us right there to worship him. Why do you come to church? But a lot of times I think we fall short of that, don't we? Yes. You know, that verse stood out to me uh, the other night when I studied that more so than, than it has in the past, I guess, because a lot of times it's so easy just to get in a routine. Yes. You get up at a certain time, you do this, you do that, you just come to church. But listen, we should come with a purpose and an intent, intent to worship Him. It's all about Him. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about this building. It's about worshiping him. King of kings, Lord of lords. But those wise men came with a purpose. And their purpose was to worship him. And boy, wouldn't it be amazing if, if God's people really got a hold of that, not just here in America, but worldwide, and we just try to come to the feet of Jesus, find him, diligently seek him, and we're there to worship him. Simply worship him. Not to ask for all these things. Not to use him as a spare tire when things aren't going right. Not to do the things the way uh, average Christianity is in America. Mm -hmm. But what if it, what if we we diligently seek after him and truly worship him? Just a thought. So I thought those wise men came with that intent. They came with that purpose to worship him. It says, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. They said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. So here's a reference and back to the Old Testament, giving Herod the information, hey, this is what the Old Testament says. This is where he's going to be. Born in Bethlehem of Judea. And he says that he demanded of them. He brought together all these political powers, all the lawyers, all the uh, chief priests, he scribes, all these people that he could get in, in governmental authority. He, he got them in a room to say, where is he at? And, of course, we know why he did that, because he wanted to kill him. 
He, he saw him as a threat to his yeah. throne. Mm -hmm. That it was all about idolatry and jealousy and stuff like that. We see that stuff today. But notice that he says when Herod the king had heard these things in verse 3, he was troubled. Mm -hmm. You know what? A lot of people today when they hear about Jesus, guess what? They're troubled. Mm -hmm. yes. They're troubled. It, it, it's sad, but I got to thinking about that. And it even went on to say, not only he was troubled, but it said uh, right there, and all of Jerusalem with him. That's his own people, right? That's his own people. And they all troubled. Why? Because of his birth. Because of his birth. People are troubled about him today. Guess what? There's people today that want to take him out. They want they they don't want any existence of him in a in a textbook in a school book no prayer no they want to kick him out of schools they want to kick him out of the out of all federal buildings they want to kick him out of this kick him out of that listen it, this stuff that happened then is happening today yes. there's still a bunch of Herods out there today they're troubled when they hear about Jesus. They don't want nothing to do about Christianity. They don't want nothing to do with Jesus. They don't want that. They don't want any of that. Why? Because it affects the way they want to live their life, the way they want to believe. Because, oh, I can't have a good time. It's, 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 it all goes back to like an idolatry uh, uh, point of view. But he says here, it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, Art not least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor and shall rule my people Israel. Notice that there. It says, Judah art not least among the princes of Judah. Bethlehem was a small, little, insignificant place. He wasn't born in a great big city, in a great big palace. No, he was born in a manger. In lowly little Bethlehem of Judea. You got, and the reason it says of Judea like that is because there's actually multiple Bethlehems. And the Bible wants us to understand that the Old Testament prophets pinpointed the exact place where he was going to be born, the exact city of where he was going to be born. That's why we have Bethlehem of Judea. The Bible never contradicts itself. The Bible is never wrong. It is perfect. And I'm thankful for that. God's word is perfect. But it says that uh, Bethlehem uh, excuse me Judah or at least among the princes of Judah for out of thee shall come a governor notice the capital G governor that shall rule my people Israel the word rule there actually also means interpreted back into the Greek it means feed to feed his people how many times did Jesus talk about him being the shepherd people being the sheep and yes. feed my sheep yes. feed my sheep remember that but he says that these, after out of these shall come a governor. The ultimate governor. The ultimate leader. The ultimate ruler. That's why I said earlier during prayer requests and stuff, you know, we need to be praying for our president and our leaders, federal, state, local, everybody. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad and thankful that, hey, they're not in control. God is. Because he's the governor that trumps all of them. That's over all of them. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Why am I not worried about all the mess that's going to happen in 2021? Because God's in control. And he said that this stuff would happen. That this stuff would come about. We're soon to his coming. I believe that. We're soon to see him return. But he says, Then Herod, when he had proudly called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He wanted to know all about this star. He wanted to know all about the Old Testament prophecies. He wanted to know exactly where Jesus was. Mm -hmm. Why? So he could take him out. Yes. Mm -hmm. So he wouldn't have a threat to his throne. Now one thing you got to remember too, the wise men here, that would have came from the east, searching diligently for the child. Yes. And knowing the scriptures of the Old Testament, they were Gentile people. They weren't even Jews. They weren't even God's chosen people. They were Gentiles says in verse number seven he called them privately inquired of them, of them diligently what time the star appeared and he sent them to Bethlehem and said go and search diligently for the young child and when ye have found him bring me word again that I may come and worship him also his type of worship was different wasn't it 
See, it's all about purpose and intent. The wise men, they had the right heart, the right attitude to begin with. They wanted to worship him. Herod said, I want to come worship you. You know what? We still have that same kind of dilemma and issues in the churches today. He says, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and what? Worshipped him. They fell down and worshipped him. And notice in that verse, too, who's mentioned first? Jesus. Normally, it would be speaking of the mother first and then the child. But this verse is written where it's the child first, Jesus first, and then Mary. Why? Because God's always first. Yes. He should always be number one. He should always be listed as first. They're not there to worship Mary and Joseph. They're there to worship baby Jesus. It says, and they worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. Three different gifts, three different things that they gave baby Jesus. And many people believe this is where the whole idea of Christmas presents came from. Yeah. Of why we give people gifts at Christmas time is because the wise men brought gifts to Jesus. And they brought him gifts that were fit for a king. Mm -hmm. And each one of these had a meaning to it. Yeah. Gold that they brought him actually refers to uh, deity and glory. It refers to deity and glory. It, it, it means Jesus, his shining perfection. His shining perfection. Listen, Jesus... When he was on earth, was perfect. No sin, didn't do anything wrong, shining perfection. Why? He was the ultimate sacrifice for you and for me. He couldn't have spot, couldn't have blemish, couldn't have any, have any of that stuff. The frankincense, it was an ointment or a perfume. And it represents the life of sinless perfection. The life that he lived that was sinless, it was perfect. And then the myrrh that is mentioned is actually a bitter herb, a bitter herb. And it's actually a, a sign of the suffering that is to come. The suffering that is to come. Remember, Jesus was born to die. He was born to suffer for you and for me. He would endure in bearing the sins of the world. And just 33 years, uh, 33 years later, he would be hanging on a cross, bearing the sins of the world. Think about that for a minute. That's what the myrrh represents, the bitter herb of the suffering that he would go through. It says, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Those wise men, thank God those wise men didn't go back to Herod. They listened and they went another way. But listen, isn't that a picture of salvation? When you find yourself at Jesus' feet, when you get to Jesus, you worship him, and you find your, 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 uh, yourself at his feet, guess what? You're not going to go the same way you came. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians that you're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. So when we meet Jesus, when we're saved at that moment, guess what? I'm not going to go back the way I came. I'm not going to go back to the stuff I came from. I'm going to go a new direction, a new way. I'm thankful these wise men, they fell down, they worshiped Jesus. And they went a new way. They didn't go back to Herod. I'm thankful for that. We talked about how Jesus, he's God with us. That name, Emmanuel, he's God with us. But he's also Jesus. Jesus is God with us. For us. He's for us. He's in our corner. He's on our side. He's a good, good father. I'm thankful for that this morning. You don't have to flip here, but I want to turn to just a few verses this morning, if I may, in Romans chapter number 8 and in verse number 31. It says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I like that verse. I have to remind myself of that verse a lot of times. When it seems like everything's crashing in on you and people are coming after you, the, the, the devil uh, is attacking you and you're surrounded, guess what? If God be for us, who can really be against us? We're going to come out victors 
That doesn't mean it'll be an easy battle. That doesn't mean that we're going to come out uh, 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 looking wonderful after we're done fighting through that battle. But hey, guess what? He's going to be there with us, and he's going to be for us through that battle. I'm glad that he's for us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Guess what? There's no person on planet Earth that can go against us over God. Nobody. I'm thankful for this verse right here that we have that promise. I like the verse over uh, in 1 John. You don't have to flip. Uh, like I said, I just want to share a few things with you here to encourage you. But in 1 John chapter 4, verse number 4, it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I love that verse. Think about that for a minute. If you're saved this morning, if you're a child of God this morning, what lives on the inside of you is greater than anything this world has got. It's greater than anything we could imagine happening on planet Earth. What lives inside of you is greater. Think about that for a minute. It's greater. No matter what comes our way, no matter what we face, no matter the, the, the popularity, the, the fame, the money, the whatever you can think of out there to fill in the blank, guess what? What's on the side of you is greater. I'm thankful for that this morning. Jesus, he's God with us. Jesus is God for us. But Jesus is the one and only who can save us. He's the one and only. Go over to John chapter 14. I want you to see this for just a minute. John chapter number 14, very familiar scripture, familiar verses, if you've been in the Word of God any at all, really. And, of course, these verses are used a lot during funerals and, and things like that. But I love John 14 because there's truth here. And, and in verse number 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. Don't worry. Don't be all confused. Don't be a mess. It says, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? I like that. He said, Lord, how can we know the way? Jesus gave the perfect response in verse number 6. He says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, that means nobody, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. If any of us make it to heaven, you know how we're going to make it there? Yes. We're Jesus Christ. It's not going to be anything that I did. It's not going to be anything that I did or didn't do. Not how much money's in the bank. Not how good of works I've done. How much I've donated to charity. None of this. None of that. It, none of that's going to matter. That's all going to burn up one day. What's going to matter is if I put my hope and faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The one that was born to die, did I call on him to save me? Did I say, Lord, I want to make you Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. Listen, you go through him, you get to heaven. You try any other way, you're going to find yourself in heaven. That's the, that, that is one of two ways. You try anything other, Jesus Christ, you will spend eternity. And listen, I want to tell you, hell was not intended for you and for me. It was for Satan and his angels. But listen, the way people go there is because they reject this right here, what I just read. They reject Jesus Christ and they find themselves in hell. There's probably more prayers going up right now in hell. I mean, think about it for a minute. Saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Lord, I, I now understand that verse. But you know what? It's too late. Listen, the greatest gift that has ever been given to mankind is Jesus. The greatest gift we could ever receive is Jesus. Why? Because it has eternal effects. It will last forever. And I'm thankful.
this week, Christmas coming up, I guarantee you we're all going to get something. And a few years down the road, it's going to rust out. It's going to break. It's going to tear up. Not fit. Whatever. <laughs> but listen, the gift that God gives us is eternal. It lasts forever. He said, he told Thomas there, he said, listen, he says, I am the way. The way that is written, that is a definite article. Mm -hmm. And if you study English language and stuff, you know a definite article means one and only way. There's no, no, no other way to describe it, no other way around it. It is the one and only way. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Amen. And it's up to you to ask him to save you. I can't save you. I can't pray a prayer that saves you. Only you can do that. It's a personal relationship. He says, I am the way. But not only that, Thomas, I'm not just the way. He says, I'm the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. No man. That means nobody that you can think of on planet Earth. It doesn't matter the amount of money, how popular they are in the world's eyes. Who it is. Listen, God is no respecter of person. Listen, you know, in, in, in the world in which we live today, everything's kind of like a totem pole. You know, you got you got this. You've always had a had a had a uh, middle class, low class, high class. It's all went up and down like this. But in God's eyes, guess what? It's all this way. I'm thankful that the ground was level at the foot of the cross. Yes. I'm thankful for that this morning. He doesn't look at how much is in my bank account, thank God. He doesn't, he doesn't look at what clothes are in my closet. He doesn't look at this. He doesn't look at that. Guess what? He looks on the inside. Yes. Man looks on the outside, the outward appearance. Yes. But what's God look at? He looks at what's in him. Mm -hmm. He knows what's on the inside of you. And guess what? You do too. Yes. It's between you and him. I hope and pray that everybody sitting under the sound of my voice, voice this morning has accepted that wonderful, perfect, beautiful gift yes. of salvation. I hope that you have. If you haven't, I, I beg you, I, I pray this morning that you will come and accept that gift before it's eternally too late. Yes. You know what? For the Christian, this Christmas might be our last Christmas here on this earth. Say, oh, you're a saint. Now, listen, I believe that. Amen. It's possible. Amen. It is possible. Very possible. You realize in our lifetime, in our generation, from the youngest in here to the oldest in here, in our generation, yes. there's been more prophecy fulfilled yes. than any other time in history. Amen. It's at a rapid pace. Yes. He says, I come quickly. He tells us, "Meantime, I'm surely I come quickly. You better, you better believe it. I'm coming quickly. Listen, he, he came the first time as a baby, as a perfect baby boy. This next time he comes back, it's going to be Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But I'm thankful this morning we can cling to these promises. Jesus, he's with us. He's for us." He's the only one that can save us. This morning, I'll ask if you would just a moment to bow your heads. Mary, if you don't mind to come to the piano for just a moment, please.